Namaste and welcome to Pods by PEI, a policy discussion series brought to you by Policy Entrepreneurs, Inc. My name is Kushi Han. In today's episode, which is the second part of a two-part series, we have Anurag Acharya, Director of Practice at PEI, in conversation with Ambassador Ranjit Ray. Ambassador Ray is a retired Indian diplomat. During his tenure of over 30 years in the Indian Foreign Service, he held various positions, including the Ambassador of India to Vietnam and Hungary, the first Secretary of the Permanent Mission of India to the United Nations in New York, and the head of the Northern Division in the Ministry of External Affairs dealing with Nepal and Bhutan. From 2013 to 2017, Ambassador Ray served as the Indian Ambassador to Nepal. During these years, Nepal witnessed some historic events including the promulgation of a new constitution and the earthquake of 2015. This was also a tumultuous period in the Nepal-India relationship, about which Ambassador Ray has discussed extensively in his recent book, Kathmandu Dilemma, Resetting India-Nepal Ties. Continuing from last week's conversation, in today's episode, Anurag gets Ambassador Ray to share details about his engagement with Nepal and its messy politics. From his ringside view of the 12-point agreement signed between Nepal's political parties and the CPN Maoist, to the challenging period in the office as an Indian ambassador to Nepal. They end the conversation by discussing Ambassador Ray's proposition on how the two countries can overcome the historic and recent tensions and mutual suspicion to reset bilateral ties that are grounded on new geopolitical realities. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Namaste. This is Anurag Acharya. Namaste. This is Ranjit Ray. And I welcome you back to the conversation where we are examining Nepal's relationship with India. Ambassador Ray, we understand your first engagement with Nepali politics and its uh, actors was back in 2005 and 6 when the 12-point agreement was being inked in New Delhi. That was a time when you were heading the North Division looking at Nepal and Bhutan. You mentioned some intricate details about this uh, in your book, Kathmandu Dilemma, Resetting Nepal uh, in India-Nepal Ties, on how different institutions within India were divided to an extent that there were parallel conversations happening with then-King Gyanendra and the Seven Party Alliance and the Maoists. Can you elaborate more on this? So I joined uh, our Northern Division in the year 2002, and that is when the Maoist insurgency was at its peak, And you would recall the DG uh, of the armed police force uh, was also assassinated, I think, in 2003. Uh, And, you know, 2001, the 9-11 terrorist incidents had happened in the United States. Uh, And in India, we had our own Naxal problem, uh, you know, the extreme left uh, uh, organization, uh, which in uh, our assessment had really degenerated into a very violent terrorist uh, uh, organization. So the prevailing opinion at that point in time was that the Maoists uh, should really be crushed. And I think that's what King Gyanendra was trying to do. And our approach was very clear from the time of uh, uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee. He was the Prime Minister when I had joined to Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. India's mantra for Nepal was the twin pillar mantra, which was constitutional monarchy and multi-party democracy and that it's the Maoists, the insurgents that are evil and they must be degraded uh, and destroyed uh, by the Royal Nepalese Army uh, at the time. And so we had supported the Royal Nepalese Army very strongly. We had set up a bilateral working group uh, to provide arms, ammunition uh, and equipment. And that was the prevailing uh, Uh, theory, that was the prevailing thinking uh, in India. Of course, over a period of time between 2002 and 2005, uh, things changed politically in Nepal. And gradually you had a situation of appointed prime ministers till ultimately King Gyanendra took over complete executive power. Uh, And that India was very dismayed at. Uh, And, you know, our sense was that For there to be stability in Nepal, it is very important for the monarchy and the political parties to work together. Uh, That this was a balance that had emerged after 1990. And this balance should be maintained. It cannot be rolled back. And I think it's only after King Gyanendra's uh, 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 takeover uh, uh, of executive power that things changed. 
and the other two sides, the other two actors in this whole uh, process, the Maoists uh, and and uh, the political parties uh, got together. Uh, the Indian establishment was very divided even then because there were voices which said that, look, it's more important to ensure that the Maoists are decimated. Uh, if the king has taken over executive power, doesn't matter because he's going to destroy the Maoists and that's a good thing. And, you know, democracy uh, will happen later. But I think... At that point in time, our assessment was that there was a military stalemate, that the Royal Nepalese Army could not crush the Maoists and the Maoists could not move from their rural areas uh, to the urban areas. So there was a military stalemate. And the sense was that th there is no option but a political solution. And so after the king's takeover of February 2005, the dynamics changed and the Maoists and the parties uh, got together. And this was really a Nepalese process owned and driven by Nepalese. It happened on Indian soil and it was supported uh, by us, but it was really a, a Nepalese process. It's interesting that you mentioned that because there are a lot of speculations uh, about that time. Some would argue that Maoists reaching out to the Indian establishment certainly helped or, or persuaded India in rethinking its uh, twin pillar policy. And some other would also argue that India was uh, vengeful of Gyanendra Sa uh, seeking Chinese support to quell Maoist movement. How would you respond to that? So obviously we would be unhappy if the king was seeking Chinese support and especially military support. But, you know, that, as you said, is one of the flexible issues uh, in our first episode we discussed. But I think our strategic view was that there is a balance between the monarchy and the political parties, and that must be maintained. And it's only if these two forces work together that the Maoist insurgency will get resolved. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Uh, and, and, and that is the reason why the other two forces got together. I think the Maoists also realized that there was no way that they could militarily take over. And, you know, the Maoists had made uh, an outreach to the government of India during Prime Minister Vajpayee's time. But we had not responded to them at all. We responded to them only after the king's takeover of February 2005, when the first preliminary contacts at official level uh, were made uh, with the Maoist leadership, uh, you know, initially Baburam Bhattarajji and then subsequently uh, Prachand. So you, you have to see the evolution of India's position over a period of time and in sequence. Of course, there was also a contradiction between India's uh, own domestic policy regarding the Maoist and then its uh, Nepal policy regarding their uh, Nepali comrades. While Manmohan Singh government saw the Indian Maoist as the single most threat uh, within the country, why was it willing to engage with the Nepali Maoist? Well, certainly the Prime Minister Manmohan Singh had termed the Indian Naxals as the biggest threat uh, to our country. And you know, we had followed this Greyhounds model uh, in Andhra Pradesh, which was very successful in uh, neutralizing uh, the uh, the Indian Naxalites. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, those were also the days of uh, this uh, uh, red corridor going all the way from Nepal to India. And there was a fear that if the Maoists take over in Nepal, it will become a safe haven for Indian Naxals. And hence... It was in India's interest that the Nepalese Maoists are also uh, destroyed. But we realized over a period of time that there was a military stalemate and that there was no way that the Nepalese Maoists would be destroyed militarily by the Royal Nepalese Army. So in such a situation, what option do you have? So the only option is then to tentatively see, and I think this is what the political parties did, is to engage with the Maoists. Of course, even the king was talking to the Maoists, as were Nepali Congress uh, and the UML, and try to see if some modus vivendi, if some possible solution can be worked out. Obviously, if no solution was worked out, then the insurgency would have continued. Many more people would have lost their lives. I mean, 17,000 people lost their lives during the 10-year insurgency. So if there was no settlement, can you imagine how many more innocent lives would be lost? Well, 
In 2013, of course, you landed in Kathmandu as an Indian ambassador. Just when things were heating up on the constitutional front, the first uh, CA had been dissolved, the Maoists were out of power, and the date for the second uh, CA elections were scheduled. The outgoing ambassador, Jayant Prasad, and uh, you know Rakesh Sood before him were already being criticized for their visible role, especially with regard to support for the agitating uh, Madisi parties. What was going through your mind when you arrived here as an ambassador of a country that shares an open border with Nepal, has uh, some legitimate security concerns? But how would you define India's stake in the political process then? That was essentially Nepal's internal process. So at a fundamental level, it is in India's interest that there is peace and stability in Nepal. If there is insecurity and instability in Nepal, given our open borders, we feel this will also spill over into India. And we have already seen in the past when Nepalese territory has been used for purposes that have been inimical to Indian security or to Indian interests. So I think a fundamental uh, objective of our policy was to see that there is a stable and secure Nepal. That's in our interest. It's in Nepal's interest too. And hence, India very strongly supported the Constituent Assembly elections, the number, the second Constituent Assembly elections. We provided a lot of assistance and support uh, to the Nepalese uh, authorities. In fact, I remember, you know, very soon after I came here, I had a meeting with editors of uh, uh, National Dailies of Nepal. I think it was a week before the elections. And you can't imagine how skeptical they were. Many of those very senior journalists wondered whether the Maoists would participate in the elections or not, or whether the elections would even be held just one week before the elections. So I think India and the entire international community felt it's absolutely essential that the elections are held, that a constitution is drafted, because that is the path to peace, security and stability in Nepal. At a personal level, you know, for me, Nepal has been my dream job. And so, uh, you know, this is something I had always wanted. Uh, because I find it to be a fascinating country. So I was very excited uh, to come to Nepal at such a challenging time. In your book, you also mention about your close and frank relationship with uh, some of the senior political figures in Nepal. We are probably more appreciative of uh, Indian concerns regarding the constitution drafting. But then this was also seen as open meddling by uh, Nepali media or sections of Nepal's civil society. When you look back, do you think that there is a need to reconsider this approach or the way the Indian diplomatic mission engages uh, in Nepal with various constituencies? So, you know, the so-called Indian meddling, you have to see it in context. India, in some way or the other, was associated with the peace process and the agreement of November 2005 between the political parties and the Maoists. So that was a fundamental agreement. Again, after the Madhesi agitations of 2007-2008, India was in one way or the other associated with you know, bringing about some understanding between the government of Prime Minister Koirala and the Madhesi leaders. So the expectation was that you know, the interim constitution had accommodated the key elements of the peace process or, or of the 2006 agreement, as well as the Madhesi, uh, uh, you know, the agreements that led to the end of the Madhesi uprisings of 2007-2008. So India had been associated with these. So the expectation was that when the new constitution would be adopted, these key elements of you know, the agreements which had led to this stage of the constitution being drafted would be incorporated into the new constitution. And that perhaps in the views of some people, especially some of the Maoists and the Madesis, didn't happen. So when that didn't happen, obviously there was agitation. And that, that didn't happen because the composition of the constituent assembly changed. In the first constituent assembly, the Maoists and the Madhya, you know, were pretty dominant. In the second constituent assembly, they did very poorly. So some of the issues which had been agreed earlier upon were no longer, uh, uh, you know, the basis for understanding. And there was also a feeling that the two larger parties 
would now, uh, uh, you know, uh, go and adopt the constitution as they choose because they have the requisite majorities. So this was the context. So where India was coming from, we were saying that, look, your objective is to have peace and stability in your society. That is also India's objective for reasons I've already mentioned earlier. Now you are a very diverse society. You have different communities, different groups of people, different languages, different religions, aspirations of different groups. There is a historical context where some groups feel deprived or marginalized. They want a greater say, say in sharing political and economic resources and power. So particularly in the context of the Maoist insurgency and the Madhesi uprisings. So if you have to have peace and stability in the future, doesn't it make sense to try and take everyone along to the extent possible? And you've already signed solemn agreements with various groups. So doesn't it make sense to accommodate everybody, carry everybody along? So this was the only message that India constantly gave from the highest political levels to the level of the ambassador that please take everyone along. Because if you don't take people along, you may not have stability in the country. And that was the time, you remember, there was a secessionist movement in the Tarai led by C.K. Raut. Before that, there had been these armed vigilante groups uh, in the Tarai. There was also the extreme left-wing group of the Maoists, the splinter group that believed in violence. So the idea was that, you know, please accommodate the aspirations of the diverse communities as you've already agreed in the various agreements and take them along. Well, what I was referring to is because uh, what you say is all true and, and you could have uh, best interests at your heart. What I was referring to and, and asking about is, is the approach that the Indian you know, mission in Kathmandu chose to take. You look at uh, other missions during that time, they were quite vocal in their public outreach, in their public discourse, participating across various sectors and, and stakeholder group trying to communicate what they would like to ideally see Nepal constitution to be. Uh, whereas Indian diplomatic mission primarily chose to engage at the higher political level. Do you think there is a need to reconsider that approach when, it, uh, when India engages in Nepal in future? Perhaps. Because you're right. I mean, I think we tended to follow a more top-down approach of dealing with the political leadership because they really had the authority. And, you know, as you know, most of the contentious issues were resolved by people, a few leaders sitting at that Gokarna uh, resort, you know, five or six leaders meeting over a period of days uh, to resolve these uh, disputes. So I think they were really the key decision makers. I think civil society was important but I don't know how influential they were in terms of, you know, some of the contentious issues uh, of the Constitution. So I agree with you that in the future, we must be equally engaged with civil society actors and especially, you know, the youth uh, and not just limit ourselves uh, to political parties and, you know, certainly not just to the top leaders of political parties. I, I say this because I, I clearly remember the time when the final days of the constitution drafting and the draft was being finalized and, and India openly expressed some of its concerns uh, regarding the provisions, especially, you know, uh, those that were also raised by the Madhesis. And then, of course, uh, then uh, External Affairs Minister of India, Jai Shankar, had arrived as a special envoy. And then that uh, created quite an uproar, not just uh, in Nepali media and civil society, but also among uh, senior party members of Nepal's uh, major political parties. When you look back on that, do you think that perhaps things could have been handled in a better way or would it have been better if it had uh, not taken so much of uh, strain on the bilateral ties? So I don't think India was intrusive in terms of saying how many provinces or how much quotas and so on. That's incorrect. What actually happened was there was a story in the Indian Express which broke saying that India wants one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that was identical to what the Madhesi demands were. And, you know, that story itself was incorrect. And our spokesman in India did say that this is not India's ask. This is what the Madhesis have asked for. You mentioned about the white paper that was uh, circulated. Right? Yes. And so that was completely wrong. 
So what India had been saying is accommodate the concerns of everyone. India wasn't saying you have five, six, seven, eight provinces or you have 20% reservations. India was simply saying that, you know, since we were associated with your solemn agreements of 2005 and subsequently the Mazesi agreements, please accommodate these concerns of the others and take them along. If you don't accommodate the concerns, you'll have problems. And you could see problems already emerging even before the constitution uh, was adopted. Secondly, on the visit of the Foreign Secretary Jay Shankar, who's now our foreign minister, I think that was misunderstood by the political leadership. You know, in, in Nepal, it was projected as something very arrogant and, you know, somebody coming to dictate to the Nepalese, etc., which was not the case at all. I think the only message that our foreign secretary was trying to convey is that there is still time to accommodate those that are unhappy with the constitution. And the second message, of course, was saying, yes, you can adopt your constitution uh, and, you know, you can have widespread uh, recognition of the constitution. But, you know, it's important for Nepal, given that India is a, a very important neighbor for Nepal, that, you know, India's support for the constitution would also be desirable for Nepal. So I think, uh, you know, a lot was made of this uh, thing. And I think there was a fear in the minds of some of the political leaders here that perhaps the second constituent assembly may go the way of the first. Uh, and, you know, a lot of rumor mongering happened at that time that India does not want this constitution, etc. So, you know, which happens from time to time. Whether we would do things differently, I think we should always be open to, uh, uh, to an introspection and to see what we did, where we went wrong, uh, what could we have done better. I think any mature uh, diplomacy or foreign service, uh, you know, would do that. Were we too uh, involved uh, in this whole process? Uh, was it too intrusive? I guess history will, uh, you know, judge. But as I said, you have to see it in a certain context. You know, I had leaders from some of the Madhesi parties telling me that, look, uh, you were the, in a sense, you know, I, I can't think of a better. You were the guarantors of this agreement on the Madhesis. And now look what's happened. We haven't got anything. So, you know, how do we trust you? What value do you have? So you have to see, you know, take that also into context. So it was all these factors that influenced Indian thinking, India's role uh, in this whole process. You, of course, remained in Kathmandu until 2017 when things gradually began to improve between the two countries, at least, uh, you know, at the higher political level. Can you share some of the details about how both sides got over those difficult period uh, in the bilateral relations and, and what were the takeaway lessons, at least uh, for the Indian side? Well, first of all, as I said, in Nepal is a very important country uh, for India. So India must have a very good working relationship with the government of the day. Now, after the constitution was adopted, you had elections and, you know, the UML government came in with a thumping majority. And so you see that India sent uh, its foreign minister, even before the leader of the UML was elected head of the parliamentary party. The Indian foreign minister visited Nepal uh, to, to reach out to the new leadership. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, it's very important for both countries to have a good working relationship at the political level because of our security interests, because of our development cooperations, you know, many factors uh, in this relationship. And I think this will always be the case. You may have differences. You may not agree on everything. But it's very important to keep engaged with each other, keep talking to each other. So, uh, you know, I think this is what uh, we did. And I think gradually things uh, improved. Of course, uh, you know, you will recall again 2019, 2020, things dipped uh, very significantly. But again, there was a rapprochement. So in any, you know, close relationship, I would even say intimate relationship as between India and Nepal, there are ups and downs uh, in the relationship. And, you know, in, in Nepal, there is always this anti-India sentiment, which which is useful politically uh, uh, for leaders. So there is always this aspect. But I think the effort on both sides really is to, uh, you know, get over these temporary hiccups and focus on a strategic path. 
You have been listening to Pods by PEI. I am Kushihan. This is a quick reminder to all of you to do us a favor by sharing us on social media and leaving a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to the show. Now, let's get back to the conversation between Anurag and Ambassador Ray. Lately, there has been a lot of talk about resetting the bilateral ties between uh, Nepal and India. You also mentioned that earlier, and also you've argued about that uh, in your book. But then that requires getting over the underlying tensions, addressing them, uh, how they have uh, strained the bilateral relationships. One of the long-standing irritant between the two countries have been claim over disputed territories, you know, especially in the western part. While Nepal's recent claim to Lipu Lake and Limpia Dhura has been a unilateral one, against which uh, you've also made some elaborate arguments in your book, the dispute over other uh, you know territories like Kalapani and Susta have been formally documented by the 1981 Nepal India Joint Technical Committee Border Joint Technical Committee. In 2014, the issue was also reverted to foreign secretary levels uh, for final resolving. But then the issue has not found its way into any of the bilateral meetings uh, so far. Why do you think this has happened and, and how should the two countries go about resolving this uh, eventually? So I agree with you that the dispute on our boundary, 98% of which has been resolved and strip maps have been signed, only relates to Kalapani and Susta. And this had been accepted by both sides. Now, what happened in uh, 2020 is that Nepal suddenly enlarged its claims to include Lipu Lake Pass and Limpia Dhura. And this was a claim that went back to the year 2017, uh, 1817, soon after the Sugoli Treaty was signed. And this claim had been rejected by the British Governor General. And it had not been raised in 200 years. So now suddenly we are faced with the situation where Nepal has a much larger claim on our territory. Not only that, Nepal has also changed its border understanding and agreement with China. Because now, according to the new Nepalese claim, the Nepal-China border has shifted westwards of the present point. So this is something that India cannot accept. Because unilaterally something has been done, which has not been done for 200 years, and no justification has been given uh, for this claim. That's point number one. Point number two, if you look at it from India's perspective, today you say this is our territory, and you make a new map and say this is our territory, and then you say that, okay, now I'm prepared to negotiate with you. Why should we accept that? It's like some countries, for instance, in the South China Sea, you take over some islands, you develop some bases and you put some people over there and say, you know, this is ours. Now we are prepared to discuss it. So you can't change the status quo and then expand your claims and then say you're willing to discuss it. Thirdly, Nepal has gone for a constitutional amendment, which means two thirds of your parliament has supported the new claim. You have changed your map. Now, with what authority will a Nepalese delegation discuss with India? Because we don't know whether what your delegation discusses will be endorsed by your parliament. So unless there is some sort of commitment or guarantee from your parliament that your delegation has full powers and what your delegation agrees will be endorsed through a constitutional amendment by the parliament, how do we move forward? So I'm afraid the boundary issue has got very entangled and very complicated. And I don't see how this is going to be resolved in the near future. Of course, eventually it has to be resolved through dialogue and negotiations. But right now, I think it's become very complicated. Well, I think uh, Nepal government had mentioned that uh, Indian side was not reciprocating to its reservations about uh, road being built in the disputed territory back then. Then Home Minister, I think Rajnath Singh, had inaugurated one of the roads that was uh, leading into the disputed territory, which created quite an uproar on Nepali side. Do you think that was a trigger point that uh, entangled the whole dispute? Because that was a time when the bilateral relationship were also, you know, quite strained at at different levels, especially after the constitution was uh, uh, drafted. 
Do you think that that was a trigger point and perhaps, you know, leading to what eventually happened on the Nepali side? Perhaps in retrospect, I feel that, yes, uh, we should have taken cognizance of the uh, notes verbal that uh, Nepal had issued and started some conversations or some discussions. And I am aware that before your map was amended, there was an effort on the part of India uh, to have some uh, dialogue or discussion, but perhaps from the Nepalese side, it was too late. It was too late. Uh, but uh, yes, perhaps in hindsight, um, had we uh, you know, started discussing this matter before the precipitate action of amending the map had been taken, uh, may have been better. But, you know, that was also the time of the COVID pandemic uh, and so on. Uh, uh, and, of course, thereafter, the matter got entangled in domestic politics of Nepal and so became very complicated. Talking about long-standing irritants, you've also argued that uh, two countries should uh, reset their ties by reviewing or revising the 1950 uh, Nepal Friendship Treaty, similar to what India did in light of its evolving relationship with Bhutan. From what we hear... The proposition was also made in the report uh, submitted by the eminent persons group that was formed by the two countries some time back, which unfortunately has not been received by the Indian side. But as we see it, there seems to be a reluctance uh, on the Indian side to take on this issue. What is your understanding of this? So my belief is that any treaty to be effective must have the interests of both sides. So you have to have two sides to a treaty. If Nepal's interests are accommodated, India's are not, it won't work. If India's interests are accommodated, Nepal's are not, it won't work. So clearly a treaty to be meaningful has to accommodate interests of both countries. Now, Nepal doesn't like the 1950 treaty for various reasons. You know, they have said it was an old treaty, it was unequal because it was signed by the Prime Minister of Nepal and the, ambas uh, the high Ambassador of India and various other reasons. There are security clauses which Nepal doesn't like. Not that these have been spelt out explicitly, but that's my understanding. So fair enough. So we need to discuss. And Government of India's position was stated very clearly by Prime Minister Modi in his banquet speech uh, when he came... Uh, on his first bilateral visit in August 2014. And he said, look, we are prepared to do anything. If you don't like the treaty, you want to abrogate it, you can do it in terms of the treaty. There is a clause which says you can abrogate it. If you want to amend, it, amend the treaty, we are prepared to look at the amendments that you propose. So, you know, we are open to whatever you wish to do uh, on the treaty. And now I'm told, I haven't seen the group, uh, the eminent persons group report, but I'm told that the fundamental... Uh, uh, aspect of that uh, uh, report is really on the 1950 treaty. And I think it's important that the two countries start a discussion on the 1950 treaty and find out uh, uh, some understanding where Nepal's interests and India's interests, India's interests relate to security, Nepal's interests relate to equal treatment and, you know, some of the uh, uh, defense cooperation, etc. So I'm sure we can find common ground and, you know, develop something that is acceptable to both India uh, and to Nepal. You referred to Bhutan and I've referred to it in my book, but I have had received so many critical comments uh, from my Nepalese friends that how can you compare Nepal uh, with Bhutan? So I'm very reluctant to say that we should follow uh, the Bhutanese uh, uh, example. But all I was trying to say is that, look, with Bhutan, we have very close relations and we have been able to reach a new understanding. So similarly with Nepal, I'm sure if the two sides sit down, if the two foreign secretaries sit down, we will be able to come up with a treaty which accommodates the concerns of both Nepal and India. And the sooner we start a discussion, the better. Why should we delay? Exactly. I mean, uh, my reference to Bhutan was in a context that Bhutan was quite unhappy uh, in the later days uh, before the treaty was, uh, you know, uh, revised. So in reference to, you know, how Nepal has been quite keen on revisiting those uh, treaties of the 1950, 
there is, uh, of course, commitment made by Prime Minister Modi at the top political level. But when it comes to actually, you know, sitting down and, you know, ironing out the differences and initiating the process, that has been quite delayed. That is what I, w I was uh, referring to. So there I agree with you. It has been delayed. I don't think the foreign secretaries have met. Perhaps once they met. So it's important that the foreign secretaries convene on the question of the 1950 treaty and see how to move forward. I think uh, it's critical. And why leave this irritant? You know, in, 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 in India, we are saying, for instance, the UN Security Council is no longer representative. It was set up in 1945. Today, the world is different. It has to change. You know, India and other countries have to be permanent members. So Nepal is saying, look, this is such an old treaty. World has changed. So let's look at it. So it's a fair point, And I think uh, the two countries should immediately start uh, discussing this. So the other contentious issue in uh, Nepal-India bilateral relationship has been the China factor. While India does have uh, genuine security concerns regarding China's uh, assertive presence uh, in South Asia, and it is also true that governments or regimes, not just in Nepal, but also in larger South Asia region, have from time to time played what we call China card in their geopolitical balancing act. But tell us, should New Delhi also consider the fact that Nepal's relationship with Beijing and especially with uh, Tibet, bitter or sweet, is also historical and therefore deep. So one correction, Nepal has had a very robust relationship with Tibet historically. Uh, in uh, 1949, China took over Tibet. So suddenly Nepal now had uh, China on its border. And if you recall, in 1949, I think your government was very concerned about these developments uh, and what uh, China had done in Tibet and the implications of that for the whole region. And that is one reason why the 1950 treaty uh, between our two countries uh, was signed. Of course, over a period of time, as the world has changed, Nepal has changed, China has changed, India has changed. So the way we look at each of these countries and our relationships has changed. And today, I think Nepal sees China as a land of opportunity, especially in terms of economic prosperity, economic cooperation, and so on. And that's very valid. Uh, 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 you know, and, uh, you know, Nepal has every right uh, to develop, it, it develop its economic partnership uh, with China. As far as India is concerned, the India-China relationship has also seen a lot of ups and downs. And right now, the India-China relationship is, is, is uh, uh, at a low point following the incidents uh, in Ladakh. Uh, uh, that happened, uh, uh, you know, some time ago. And obviously, this influences the manner in which India looks at China. Uh, so, obviously, at one level, we see China expanding its footprint all over the globe, including in South Asia. And, you know, on the economic side, we know that's a natural progression that's going to happen. But there are certain aspects of this uh, uh, expansion of Chinese influence which obviously impinge on Indian security. And I think as neighbors with open borders, Nepal should be sensitive to these concerns uh, that India may have. And I think uh, that is only reasonable. That is uh, a, a reasonable expectation, I think, on the part of India, that given the kind of relationship India and Nepal share, Nepal will be cognizant of India's security concerns. Well, we've discussed all major facets of uh, Nepal-India relationship over this conversation, the affinities, the partnerships, uh, the tensions and the suspicions. As per your own proposition in the book, how do we go about resetting ties between the two countries that are so close, not just in terms of uh, geography, but also in terms of culture and kinship? And yet there are constantly, uh, they are constantly suspicious of each other's intentions and ambitions at the geopolitical levels. Do you see identifiable blockages, irritants uh, that can be tackled mutually? Or is, it, or is it just an inherent nature of this uh, relationship to be complicated and messy? Well, there is a lot of historical baggage. So at one level, I feel that the relationship will be messy. But our job as diplomats is to ensure that even in this messy relationship, we move forward uh, and strengthen our partnership. Uh, that is the strategic goal. And I think, as I said earlier, it is the economic dimension that we need to focus on. So we really need to step up our connectivity and economic partnership 
and integration in the sub-region as a whole through hydropower cooperation and you know many other uh, aspects. So that's point number one. Point number two, Nepal and India are both young countries. We have new generations of leaders. We have the youth that is aspirational. In the old days, you know, most Nepalese would, for instance, study in India. Today, there are many opportunities, China, Australia, UK, USA. So India has to step up its act. We have to do much more to reach out to all sections of society. And I'm not only referring to political parties. I'm referring to civil society organizations. I'm referring to the media. And in particular, I'm referring to the youth. So I think India's public diplomacy uh, has to, you know, really step up uh, 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 to the plate because, you know, that is where the future is. And finally, the political problems in our relationship, the irritants that you refer to, we must find some via media of trying to resolve them. Because, you know, if we don't resolve them, they keep lingering and, you know, they become uh, more complex and then they also factor into the domestic political discourse and debates. And they don't really benefit anyone. So we must find some way of addressing uh, these issues, these irritants in the relationship. Well, you are in, in, in town uh, at a very interesting time when uh, the new uh, elections are already scheduled. Where do you see Nepal-India uh, relationship uh, headed in the uh, light of new geopolitical realities in South Asia, Nepal's own developmental ambitions as well as India's uh, aspirations as an emerging power? I think the world is in a very difficult place right now. Uh, you have this war uh, conflict going on in the Ukraine. Uh, you have uh, U.S.-China contestation uh, for global influence. You have a situation where Russia and China are drawing closer together and are pitted against the so-called Western countries. You have a situation where the India-China relationship uh, is in trouble, is in difficulty. And Nepal is witness to all this. You know, we have seen the whole debate on the US-sponsored uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation projects. Uh, and, you know, the bickering between U.S. and China uh, on some of these issues relating to BRI and MCC. So it's all very visible and it's impacting uh, uh, countries and countries are finding it difficult to balance all these various uh, diverse relationships. So it's a very difficult time globally. So I think it's important for our region. It's very important for our sub-region to pull together. We need to work together. We need to insulate ourselves from the negative, uh, uh, the negative, uh, 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 how shall I say, uh, uh, influences that are emerging because of these contested and conflictual re relationships, how to insulate ourselves. So I think if we all come closer together, and especially economically, we will do much better. We will be stronger and we will be in a better position to deal with some of these very turbulent winds that are blowing uh, internationally. That's a very thoughtful note to end. Ambassador Ray, it has been an engaging conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Pods by PEI. I hope you enjoyed the conversation between Anurag and Ambassador Ray on India's evolving role in Nepal, the details about Ambassador Ray's engagement with Nepal and its messy politics, and his proposition on how to reset the Nepal-India ties. Today's episode is a part of PEI's series on managing India, China, and the U.S. in a new world order. It was produced by Nijan Rai with support from Saurabh Lama. The episode was recorded at Bin Studio and edited by Nijan Rai. Our theme music is courtesy of Rohit Shakyo from Zindabad. If you liked today's episode, please subscribe to our podcast. Also, please do us a favor by sharing us on social media and leaving a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to the show. For PEI's video-related content, please search for Policy Entrepreneurs on YouTube. To catch the latest from us on Nepal's policy and politics, Please follow us on Twitter at tweet to PEI. That's T W E E T followed by the number 2 and PEI and on Facebook at Policy Entrepreneurs Inc. 
You can also visit PEI.center to learn more about us. Thanks once again from me, Kushi Hang. We will see you soon in our next episode.